Six three four truth to get on the line of fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you so much for joining us on what will be a very important broadcast today on the line of fire. Not talking about what's happening in the culture around us, not talking about what's happening in the political world, but talking about human emotions, about hopelessness, depression, about going through the dark night of the soul. This is Michael Brown. Welcome to the line of fire where we serve as your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. The bottom of the hour, I'll be speaking with my guest, Dr. Mark Sharona, author of a new book, which tells a lot of his own story. He's a pastor, he's a scholar, and he went through a three year period of deep depression. What do you do in the midst of that? I've never gone through that. What do you do when you can't see your way out? I'm going to give you a number to call. If you yourself have dealt with depression and you've come out on the other side, how did that happen? What were some of the keys? What would you tell someone who is in deep depression today? 866-34-TRUTH, 866-3487-884. Or if you're a counselor or you do a lot of counseling as a pastor, and you've helped people navigate through a season of depression or habitual depression. What are the keys? What has been helpful? I've gone through protracted trials. In other words, months and months of intense spiritual battle and attack. And it feels like every day it's a battle to just get up and go about your business. And for me doing ministry, I remember a season where I had to pray several hours just to kind of get my head above water, to to feel normal, then to get ready to minister. Uh, But I've I've never been through real depression. The way people have described it to me, you can't see your way out. I remember talking to, to one man, he was the father of one of my friends, and I told him there's light at the end of the tunnel. He said, yeah, I can see it. It's headlights coming towards me. It was the only light he could see was he's in a tunnel and there's a train coming towards him. That in the midst of real depression, as it's been described to me, that, that when someone tells you that you're going to make it, it's okay, we're in this together, you're not alone, that what they're saying doesn't really connect with you. It's almost like they're speaking another language. The, the content does not deliver because of the state of depression that you're in. Years ago, when I was reading about uh, self-diagnosed depression and people then committing suicide and debating the issue of whether there should be legalized suicide and things like that, the the argument was that when you're self-diagnosing, it's not going to be accurate. When you're you're self-diagnosing, You're not going to see yourself the way you need to and come to an accurate conclusion because in the midst of your depression, in the midst of your hopelessness, it might seem like there's no way out. Now, to to be absolutely candid here, many times in the church, we struggle with approaching mental illness. Is there such a thing as mental illness? Is it all spiritual? Is Is it all demonic? Is it just a matter of willpower, believing the word? Many times we treat mental illness totally differently than physical illness. In other words, if, if I'm, I'm playing sports and I get injured and, and uh, brought over to the doctor, is yeah, you, you fractured your, your wrist. Okay, you look on it in the x-ray. There it is. Here's what we have. Now we, we don't do your surgery, but we're going to have to put you in a cast for a period of time. Okay. That's how you deal with it. But when you're dealing with, quote, mental illness, it's, it's, it's much more questionable. In other words, is there actually something wrong with your brain? That the brain's not functioning properly? That there's some type of chemical imbalance? Or that you have some type of sickness that's affecting your brain? Or, or overall in your body, there's some type of chemical imbalance because of which you're not thinking rationally, you're not thinking logically. I remember as a boy seeing, seeing my aunt begin to, to act irrationally. Well, she had a brain tumor. Tragically, it wasn't diagnosed until way too late, and 
and the surgery was not successful and she passed away. But you, th you think, what happened? She never acted like that before. Or there was something that was actually going on. But you can't always see it or diagnose it. Maybe it, it is demonic. Maybe it's not a physical issue, a chemical issue. Maybe it is demonic attack. It's different than the fracture of your arm, which you can look at and say, okay, there's the fracture. I know how I smashed into that wall when I fell over, and, and here's the fracture. You can see it, right? This is different. You get a blood test. Oh, you're deficient here. Okay, you can see that and adjust it. Adjust your diet or lifestyle or take some medicine. But with, quote, mental illness, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. And I'm not speaking as a mental health professional or as a professional counselor. I'm speaking as someone who just understands these basic things that are basically common knowledge, I would say, right? And, and then because the, the Bible doesn't specifically say, if you have a fractured wrist, just confess your healing and the wrist will be healed. It doesn't specifically say that. There are promises about healing, but it doesn't specifically say that. But we are told to rejoice in the Lord. That's an emotional thing right? We, we are told, let the weak say I'm strong. So many times when it comes to mental illness, the attitude is, I just have to believe more. I just have to pray more. I just have to rebuke the devil. I just have to determine to rejoice. And sometimes we do. In other words, sometimes that's how something breaks, that, that by God's grace, we make this determination, I'm going to rejoice no matter what. I'm going to praise God no matter what. In fact, by an act of our will, we can praise God no matter what. Even if it doesn't immediately pull us out of depression, we can, we can choose to praise God no matter what we're going through. You can be in acute pain and say, God, it really hurts, but I'm going to praise you because you're good anyway. But again, many times in the church, we don't know how to handle these things when it comes to mental illness or to a deep emotional rut that we're in. And we have often a real mistrust for the larger psycholog psychological psychiatric profession because much of it is mixed with Freudian analysis and worldly viewpoints and does not factor in the reality that we are spirit and mind and body. So how do we navigate this? How do we help people who are struggling? Um, I, I want to go to the phones we're going to open up the discussion, 866-34-TRUTH. I do want to give a couple of thoughts of my own, not as a professional, but as a minister of the gospel, so not as a professional mental health mental care specialist. And then our guest actually has a number of advanced degrees that interface with the subject of his very struggles, and, and, and he loves the Lord, and he loves the Word, so we get a holistic perspective. Uh, let's, <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Let's start with Paul in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome to the line of fire. Thank you. Yes, well, you know, as you're quite aware, this is a very, very complex subject matter. Um, and I'm just going to give you my two cents on it. Um, I think when people get involved in the what's called mental health system, it turns into a mental illness system. And I have consulted with a number of people over the years, Dr. Uh, Paula Kaplan, who is now deceased, who was actually on the board of the, uh, at one point, uh, for one of the writings of the DSM. And I've consulted with Daniel Mackler, um, Dr. Chuck Ruby, who wrote a book, Smoke and Mirrors, How You Are Being Fooled About the Mental Illness. Uh, and Insider's Warning to Consumers, and Dr. David Healy, who wrote Shipwreck of the Singular, Healthcare's Castaways. And so as people watch television nowadays in America, they'll see a bombardment of pharmaceutical commercials. And uh, I think these pharmaceuticals can be helpful possibly short term, but I think what happens a lot of times is that people get involved or, or they're told that there's help, and they get innocently, uh, and I'm trying to be careful what I say, but they get innocently sucked into the mental health system, which is an illness system, and a psychiatrist will 
spend 15 minutes with them and say, okay, let's give you Paxil. Let's give you Prozac. Let's give you a benzo, which are very bad. And Robert Whitaker covers all this in his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and how the disability rates have gone through the roof since 1987 when these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors were first approved, Prozac. Um, Upjohn has lied about Xanax, um, and Dr. Peter Bregan has written many books on this. Dr. Peter Bregan is uh, called the conscience of psychiatry. And so psychiatry has caused a lot of problems and a lot of pain and misery. And uh, I just think people need to be very careful when they get involved in the what's called mental health system because, again, to me, it is a system of illness and they get mm. stuck in and they get put on these various pharmaceuticals. And then, going back to Columbine, uh, you know, I hate to kind of bring that in there, but one of these two young boys who committed this uh, act was taking Lubox. And so a lot of these mass shootings, the one in Colorado several years ago, um, and I'm not saying that everybody that takes a, a psychotropic right, right. drug is, is going to go out and commit a mass shooting, but... Uh, but, but you're saying, though, that, that people are being medicated ra- and often to their detriment rather than looking at what's really happening in their lives, root causes, and trying to find practical ways to help get them whole as opposed to medicating them and then potentially putting them either in life dependence on medication or a worse situation. That's basically what you're saying. And you're specifically pointing to psychiatry because the psychiatrist can recommend medicines, whereas the psychologist is going to approach it a little differently. Hey, Paul, we got a break here, but thanks for sounding the alarm there. And he gave a bunch of references. Check out the references. I'm not expert here, but check out the references and come to your own conclusions on these things. Hey, Paul, thank you for weighing in. I appreciate it. We'll be right back. It's actually a very complex question. When we speak of Jewish people, do we mean, is this something defined religiously? Is it something defined ethnically? How do we define what is a Jew? Who is a Jew? You know, it's a conversation that continues into this day. When Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is from the Jews, right? He said to the Samaritan woman, you don't know what you're worshiping, but we know because salvation is from the Jews. There was obviously a defined group of people, the, the Jews, and in the ancient world, people were known as the Jews, and in the world today, still known as the Jews. So is it ethnic? Is it religious? Well, it's a combination of both, all right? On the one hand, if you are a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you would be considered a Jew, right? You are part of that people ethnically. So in the same way, someone that lives in America is an American, someone that lives in Italy is an Italian. If you've been there for generations, generations, that's your heritage. And then maybe you go to another country for a little while, so you're an American in Italy or an Italian in Germany, right? So the same thing with a Jew. You can be secular, you can be religious, but you're still a Jew ethnically. The other way that you can be a Jew is religiously. If you practice Judaism, if you do what Ruth did and turn away from the gods of the Moabites to worship the God of Israel and be joined with the people. So someone can convert to Judaism and they are now considered Jewish and their children would then be considered Jewish. All right. So you have people who are ethnically Jewish and are not religious. And then you have people who are ethnically non-Jewish who convert to Judaism and now become part of the Jewish people. So it is both ethnic and religious. That being said, if you completely depart religiously over a period of time, you'll lose your ethnic identity as well. With your host, Dr. Michael Brown, get on the line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. 
You know, there's a difference between some of the drugs that can be prescribed, and in some cases, it's clearly overprescribing or just putting a Band-Aid on a deeper issue or potentially creating a worse issue. Uh, there's a reason there's such a massive spike in kids being medicated these days. Uh, there's a big difference between that and a healthy approach. Uh, certain things can be fixed by diet. Yeah, uh, remarkably. Certain things can be fixed by diet. Many things, in fact. And what reminds me of this is hearing the, the ad for Dr. Stengler, our sponsor, with vitaminmission.com. Be sure to visit there. Check out the health supplements and the special discount you get as a listener to the Line of Fire broadcast. But putting healthy supplements in your body and eating and living in a healthy way fixes a lot of things, including even depression and struggles like that for many that sometimes it's the unhealthy things we're putting in our body that drag us down. Not only so, I absolutely believe the Bible is true and biblical principles will always work. In other, in other words, that whether this person has a spiritual issue, an emotional issue, a dietary issue, a physical issue, the Bible addresses those things and gives us wisdom and how to approach them. But often we are overly simplistic. Often we make something complex too simple. Uh, often we make someone feel bad for something that is absolutely not their fault, which then only adds to the problem. And, and do you feel free? 866-34-TRUTH. I'm going back to the phones in a moment. Would you feel free? Do you feel free? In, in a time of real deep struggle, I'm not just talking about, hey, I'm really under spiritual attack and I need prayer, but actually going through depression. Would you feel free to, to share that with friends in church? Would you feel free if you were a leader to open up to other leaders and say, hey, this is, this is going on in my life? Just wondering. Because certain things, hey, it's not my fault. I'm under attack. Or it's not my fault. I'm physically sick. But when it comes to our mental, emotional state, sometimes we feel like, well, if I say anything, I'm confessing that I'm weak. We need to create an environment where people feel safe talking about their struggles and getting help. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Andrew in Maryland. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hello, Dr. Brown. Um, I, hello, Dr. Brown. I'd like to weigh in on the topic, if you don't mind. Please. Yeah, well, it's kind of my story because I actually used to struggle with anxiety and depression. It was nine years ago when I was in college. I lost a oh, I lost a whole lot of stuff. Like, I got kicked out of a few co college majors of my choice because I didn't make the grade. A lot of Christian friends actually went astray and believed and started embracing stuff that wasn't biblical. I, and, and I did struggle with unwanted sexual stuff. And I got to tell you, I went through such a major depression for those five, three reasons. And... When I could have, should have withdrawn from a course, like I was in a secular college at the time, four year college, like I didn't withdraw because I didn't want my parents to think I was giving up. So, unfortunately, to my own detriment, I stayed with the course in spite of me not being in good physical and mental shape. And I ended up being on academic probation for a while. And I'll, and one of the things that actually got me through was actually start, was actually going to the gy gym for the first t for the first time and actually improving my eating to where I've actually gotten some help. And I've and ever since I graduated college, I actually became more involved in a local in a local church and have been listening to Christian podcasts like Hope in Hope for the Heart with June Hunt and New Life with Steve Arburn, and a, something by David Kyle Foster, and even listening to your show. So a lot of those things have helped me a lot. Like, I may still struggle with with a, with, anxiety, with a little bit of anxiety and depression. COVID did not help at all with that struggle, by the way. But mm. at least now I know that things are pretty good in terms of how I can get get some good help nowadays. 
Well, Andrew, first, I'm so glad that you've come through that and that you can share things and that you can be so candid uh, about this. And interesting, so getting your body in better shape, working out, and then changing your diet was, was a source of relief as, as well. Let me, ask, let me ask one thing quickly. Uh, obviously, there's a long answer you could give, but, but in short, when you were in your worst moments, w- were you devoid of hope? Did you think I'll never get out of this? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was it. I actually saw myself being like uh, being somewhere in this grave for that reason. As in, like I didn't. As in, I mentally thought I would end up that way. Mm. Mm. And and I mean, fortunately, go ahead. Yeah, fortunately, it didn't happen. But fortunately, that wasn't the case. But unfortunately, but my men. But fortunately, unfortunately, my mental state was exactly going there. Got it. Got it. Well, thank God for his grace in this. Would you say that that behind the scenes, maybe unknown to you, that, that God was carrying you through this and that that's how you, you made it? Or were there any key people that, that stood out as encouraging you through through the dark time? Well, I, well in hindsight, I think God has kind of kept, kept me through it. And he did exact, and he did exactly... Yeah, he did bring me through it, and I did have some um, an uncle, who, some uncle figures who kind of helped me through it. But unfortunately, that but that was kind. Of, I did have a few rare people, yeah. people in my life who kind. Of, yeah, yeah. But hey, mostly hey, God brought me through it. Yeah. So, so Andrew, thank you for sharing that, and I believe you've given hope to some people who say, "Well, that's where I am right now." God hasn't left you, friend. In your darkest moment, if you're his child, he hasn't left you. And if he wanted you destroyed and you were that bad, it would have happened a long time ago. The other thing is, if you know someone struggling, just be there for them. Say, hey, I'm here. I'm here. You, you never know what, what difference that'll make. Thank you, Andrew, for weighing in. Uh, let's go to Nikki in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the line of fire. Go ahead, please. Hey, Dr. Brown, it's Nikki from Portland. Good to talk to you again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so I'm both um, in the profession and a, a sufferer of major depression. Actually, was recently diagnosed as uh, bipolar disorder. So mm. I was actually diagnosed incorrectly, but I know depression. That's been my whole life. And, and so I just remember as an atheist one time in treatment laying there, and they said, you know, imagine your higher power know all this higher power stuff and i didn't believe in god um as a jewish atheist but i remember this this giant kind of glowing pink hand holding me and i that always stuck with me like what what is it and i felt like god's peace on me but i didn't believe in god so what is this and so once i um once he saved me you know he healed a lot of the physical stuff but he didn't take away he didn't take away the mental stuff he didn't take away the emotional stuff i think that's what wanted me to do to kind of walk it through so he could build my character in the way that he needed to but i always remember looking back that he was there and so that's what i clung to going through what i'm going through now is just um really using the knowledge of him and that he's there and and the psalms are so helpful for that but what i found in addition to prayer and the the fellowships of the saint and the worship is you know, we do need good biblical counseling. Like, that's part of it. And if we do need medication, I believe that is part of it. We can't, you know, our, we're, we live in a fallen world, and our bodies are not what they should be, and diet and exercise. So that's what I've come to know, and I'm so grateful that you're doing this show, because what I find um, in the church um, is that it's kind of, like, cuckooed, and no one wants to talk about it, and they say, yeah, you believe enough, and you have enough faith you will be healed. And sometimes we have to walk through the process that God has given us. So that's what I have to share today as a professional and someone who has gone through it. Uh, Nikki, well, well, thanks. Thanks for calling in and taking the time. We've got one minute before the break. Then my guest, Dr. Mark Sharona, his book, On the Edge of Hope, No Matter How Dark the Night, The Redeemed Soul Still Sings. So Nikki, if you could just talk to those struggling with depression now for one minute, what would you say to them? If they're believers, what, uh, what would you say? Yeah, your, your rock, your rock is Jesus. He is, he is not left you. 
He has not left it. He's there. Cling to it. Find other people that you, in the saints that you can just be with, that you can share with, and worship. Worship your living God, and he will lift you out. And that's what I have to say. And and you're, as far as being a professional, what, what do you do? Right now, so I used to do uh, marriage and family therapy, but now I'm working with autistic kiddos. So, yeah, I get to work with autistic kiddos and their families. So, wow. Yeah. All right. Well, may, may the Lord use you and may he bring you to a place where depression is a thing of the past, that you've grown in grace and you, you've come out of that and, and can help so many others that, that struggle. Appreciate the call and appreciate all that you do. All right. We come back. My guest, Dr. Mark Sharona, Pastor Mark Sharona, a dear friend and a man who's, who's laid it out. I mean, talk about a raw, honest memoir. Again, the name of the book, On the Edge of Hope, no matter how dark the night, the redeemed soul still sings. going to have an eye-opening interview with for you, not with you, but for you, on the other side of the break. Stay right here. I remember being in synagogue as a Jewish teenager. This was before I knew the Lord, before I had become a born again follower of Jesus. And I remember in my days of drug use and rebellion, 14, 15, 16 years old, I remember going to the synagogue because I was required to go with my mom and dad and family. And we would go just a few times of the year, special holy days and things like that. And I remember going through the prayer book and reading this, again, this was in my time of rebellion against God and getting high and, 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 and living in, in ungodly ways. I remember reading the prayer book and thinking to myself, God must be on some kind of ego trip. I mean, look at what he's saying about himself. And he wants us to say all these praises to him. I remember actually thinking those thoughts. And, and yet you have verses in the Bible. For example, Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. Why does God say those things about himself? Is it egotistical? Is, is he power hungry? Is it that he wants human beings to worship him for his own ego's sake? I, I remember a professor whose family had survived the Holocaust and he had survived the Holocaust. And I was told that he had gone from being an Orthodox Jew to an atheistic Jew. And, and he was saying to me when I was in his college class that, that for us to praise God and for God to want us to praise him, that would be like a human being surrounded by flies and saying, I am the great one. I am the powerful one. Now come and worship me. And I understand his perspective. That's how many people look at it from the outside. But God, who is love, his essence is love. He exists in absolute completeness in himself. When he draws our attention to him, when he calls us to praise him, when he calls us to look to him, when he tells us who he is, it is for our good. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need a pat on the back. He doesn't have an ego that needs to be stroked. He is eternal deity and of subject. He calls us to worship and praise him because it changes us. Because as we recognize who he is and come into right relationship with him, now the order of the universe comes into right place. Now justice unfolds. Now we understand mercy, compassion, goodness. And as we look to him, we are transformed into his image. And as we praise and glorify him, he's here for us to bless us as we praise and glorify him. It reminds us of his goodness and greatness. It stirs our faith so we can believe him and pray and give him the worship that he deserves, but it's for our good. Join me, friends, at askdrbrown.org. So many more resources waiting for you right there. Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on The Line of Fire. 
Have you ever found out something about a person that was shocking that as you knew them, while you were friends or colleagues, coworkers, that they were going through a hellish season and you had no idea about it until afterwards? Or, or maybe you knew a little bit, but you didn't know the depths of it. Well, sometimes it's shocking to get the whole story. And Pastor Mark Sharona, who's been in ministry for decades, who's a scholar, and who is a man who believes in the power of God to set the captives free, he shared his own story now in a book titled, On the Edge of Hope, No Matter How Dark the Night, the Redeemed Soul Still Sings. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Line of Fire. Great to be here. So let me ask first, before we get into any details, why did you decide to write this book? I mean, it's raw, it's vulnerable. Why'd you do it? That's it, Michael. That's a great question. I, you know, I wrestled. Um, and obviously, the, the period of time that I wrote about took place from 2007 to 2010 and a half. And I think it took me this long um, because I think it took me a while to process it all and to feel secure enough and strong enough to be able to tell the story for the sake of others. Mm. And um, so when I had been sharing a bit about it at a meeting and, and one of the agents from Baker was there from Chosen and they said, you know, Mark, would you be willing to write the book on this? And and while I said yes, I said it with a little bit of hesitation in my voice because I had to revisit the journey in order to do that. So there were some painful places I had to go, and I think there was an unconscious awareness that if I ever were to tell the story, I'd have to go back and revisit some things that we prefer to try to forget. Yeah. So, But I finally felt like... God was saying it was time, and there were people that were hurting, and it might be an appropriate time to be self-disclosing for their sake. So, so Mark, in, as far as in your professional academic career, do you have any degrees, or have you done any studies that tie in with the, the question of human psychology? You're in pastoral yeah. ministry. I know other scholarship you've done, but, but what, what interfaces with that? Yeah, I was I was 43 credits away from my PhD in psychology when I hit that perfect storm that is part of the story of the book. Uh, all right. So, so so you've counseled many people over the years as a pastor. Yes. You were right. you were doing advanced degrees in psychology and now yeah. you find yourself in this dark night of the soul. Hey, why don't you just pull yourself out of it, man? Come on. You're yeah. a man. Just pull yourself out. <laughs> why Why doesn't that work? Yeah, and if, if Michael, you, we, we both know each other really well, and we know the body of Christ really well, so you, you already know that I heard that from a lot of people. Um, it was the obvious question. It, it's not a whole lot different than... Jesus in his hometown saying, no doubt you would quote this proverb, physician, heal thyself. I, I, I think the, the irony of, of our humanness is that we really can't help ourselves, that God calls us to be other-oriented, and even if we have all the logical, rational, reasonable answers, when we're going through what we go through, we lose our sense of perspective, and other people have to mirror back to us the love of God so that we can regain our footing and our grounding and be able to move forward. So we need one another, and I think that lesson taught, that, that season taught me a level of needing others in a way that perhaps no other season in my life did. All right, so before we, we talk about coming through this, coming out of it, Again, friends, the name of the book, On the Edge of Hope, paint a picture of what you were going through, what life was like during this three-and-a-half-year period, and whether you were still functioning professionally, ministry-wise, yeah. uh, during this season. Yeah. What did it look like and feel like? Okay, so up until, uh, well, I mean, even through that moment, I mean, I was, you know, Michael, both, of, both you and I were, were immersed in an atmosphere of, renewal, refreshing revival. We're both passionate about the move of God. 
um, I was, I, yeah, we, I use the phrase blowing and going. I, you know, between my appearances on television and my travel around the world and around the nation, meetings every week of the month, traveling here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, almost um, with an endless pull on that deposit in your life when when you feel like you've got something that God has given you to share with others. And that was, uh, you know, that was a way of life. And I, I, I didn't see, the, if I had seen the bus coming, I'd have gotten out of the way. But there were a number of instances that led to a perfect storm. And I don't talk about all of them in the book for the sake of privacy, but one of them, one of them was we we were in the middle of a major building acquisition and we went from a seven thousand dollar a month mortgage to a seventy thousand dollar a month first mortgage and fifty thousand dollar a month balloon. Oh my. And I had I had we had a few thousand people, but when we relocated the majority of those people decided not to come, and I was down to 400 adults. And um, the stress of that financial pressure began to build over that next few months when we got in the building in December of 2006. I felt the weight of that financial stress. Now, mind you, I, you know, I, I thought pretty, I was pretty confident about my ability to to encourage people to give and to steward that kind of a building project, and you know, I was. On TBN, I was I, I helped them raise money for the gospel all around the world, and um, so I felt pretty confident. But when when that anxiety hit me, it was intense. And then within that, you know, we went through a season with our younger son that led to affect the whole family, and it it about it about did me in, and it lasted for a long time. And the stress of that, plus the stress of the finances. Uh, put a weight on me that I had never experienced in my life, and um, it crushed me. It literally crushed me. So, so Mark, what's the difference between going through a hard time, going through a battle, and suffering from real depression? What's the difference? Oh, gosh. I, I've been through tough seasons in my journey before. We, we both have. We've both had our share of spiritual warfare. Yep. But this, and and, I, and at a season in my life when when I was um, going through major transition, I remember feeling disoriented and despairing. But but honestly, Michael, when when Paul says to the church at Corinth in Second Corinthians that he didn't want them to be unaware of the struggle he went through, that when he was on his way, that in Asia he was excessively burdened to the point of despairing of life, that the sentence of death had been passed in him, that he shouldn't trust in himself but in God who raises the dead. I, I know what that's like now. I also know what it's like when Job says, the thing that I greatly fear has come upon me. We have so misinterpreted that text, and you're, you're, you're Jewish, so you know that the Hebrew ways of looking at wisdom literature are different than the American way of saying this says this at a surface level. And um, but, but between the thing that I greatly fear, the way it's understood Hebraically, and the way it's understood in wisdom literature, and the despairing of life, they both came together with a force that had to be reckoned with. And ironically, Michael, you and you met Vinny Manzo at Issachar, but Vinny was one of my best friends, and I dedicated the book to him, and he just passed away last week, so he never got to see a copy of the book. Mm. Uh, but he walked me he walked me through that season, um, and if it weren't for him, I'm not sure where I'd be. So this went on, not for three and a half days or weeks or months, but three and a half days. Years? Years. Yes, three and a half. <clears throat> it was a long, long, dark night. So long, did, dark night. did you have breakthroughs where everything seemed normal and you thought, I'm, I'm out of this, I'm done, and fell back? Or no. was it, it was dark the whole time? It was the entire time. And the sleeplessness was chronic. Um, and I was seeing, I had to also <laughs> see a therapist and, and a medical doctors, and they tried me on different various medications, most of which... Um, gave me problems and and um, 
it was it, there were challenges all the way around. Um, but I'm grateful for Jesus, and I'm grateful for the enduring love of God, and for the the key voices in my life that kept reminding me of who I was, and that this was a season and not a life sentence. And and during this time, who was God to you, and how real was He to you? You know, um, it was it was a season where it felt like God had totally abandoned me. Um, I knew God was there, but it was as if the one who I had so thought I knew well went radio silent. I could sense the presence, but I had no sense of a living word to run with. I had to rely on Vinny and some caring others just to remind me of what God had said. And, you know, obviously I, I, I went to Scripture. You know, one of the verses that that became a life verse for me was Deuteronomy 33, um, in the, the eternal God, 26, 27, the eternal God is our dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. It didn't matter how far I felt like I fell, but the Father's arms, the Son and the Spirit, undergirded me and caught me up and sustained me. There were times I didn't realize I was being sustained. There were times I thought I was going to lose it, and yet in moments when I thought I was going to lose it, there was just this clarity that would remind me, i got to just keep going. And, you know, at the same time, Michael, I even, you know, I've made my living on the road. I've I've not taken a salary from the church. I never have. And the last few years, the church has begun to give me something. But So I had to still function while I wasn't able to function and generate income to take care of what was going on in my family, well, the, da- the daily bills, the daily chores. Plus, I had to continue to preach and sustain that local, the local church. And so oh. I was clear in the pulpit, but everywhere else I wasn't. Extraordinary. Friends, the book, On the Edge of Hope, no matter how dark the night, the redeemed soul still sings. How did God bring Mark out of this? And what would he say to those in the midst of it? That's what we'll take up when we come back. Stay right here. Can we really make the scripture say whatever we want it to? Can we twist the Bible in any direction? Can we take a verse and, and get a wrong message from it? Yeah, if you read it wrongly, if you treat it wrongly, you can. So there's an example that's commonly used where Jesus is speaking to Judas. So it's John chapter 13 and verse 27. They're at the Last Supper, and it says, After he had taken the morsel, so Judas takes the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Then you read another verse, and it says, Judas hung himself. Then you have Jesus saying elsewhere, go and do likewise. You've seen this done, go and do likewise. You can pull a verse here, 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 and put it together to make a message that's totally contrary to the Bible. You can do the same thing with any book. You can do the same thing with a, a phone book, you know, and pull out a page here and a line here and a sentence there to make it mean whatever you want. But if you read the Bible rightly, no, you can't make it mean whatever you want it to mean. You can't make it say whatever you want it to say. So what's the key? Read everything in proper context and read everything with respect to the type of literature it is. Understand poetry is poetry. If the Bible says God is our rock, it doesn't mean that he is a physical rock. If you're reading something that Paul wrote, don't just pull out the one line, look at the whole letter. And then if you need more context, look at Paul's other letters. Or if you need more context, look at the rest of the New Testament. Or if you need the fullest context, look at the whole Bible. And then understand, as God speaks and reveals himself, that we get more and more insight into who he is and his nature, not contradicting what comes before, but clarifying as we continue to read the full revelation through the cross. Read it rightly, and you'll understand it rightly always. Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. 
My guest, Dr. Mark Sharona, says this, the scariest place can also be your threshold. Step through it, knowing God is there with you, and healing can happen right in the middle of your chaos, the book On the Edge of Hope. So, Mark, how is it that the Lord brought you out of this three-and-a-half-year dark night of the soul? Well, it wasn't a one, two, three sort of solution. It was a gradual learning how to cope with anxiety and learning how to cope with the the oppression and learning how to cope with the depression. There were many things I had to learn about negative emotions, afflictive thoughts, um, you know, the, the, I had to really get, get free from magical thinking that if I just confess the word, it'll go away. Um, I can, I th- certainly think there's a place for confession, don't get me wrong, but magical thinking is not the way through some of the kind of afflictive internal realities I was facing. It only happened one step at a time, one day at a time. I had to live in daytight compartments. I had enough grace to manage one day at a time. Looking back, it was 1,800 and some odd days. It was 78 days or something like that, but I knew them each as one long day, and and many of those nights were sleepless nights, so how I made it through um, was was really one step at a time, Michael, and um, it was difficult. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to soft soap it because it was, it was pretty painful. But I think I, I think I, I realized somewhere um, in the journey that the more I fought it, the more power I gave it, and I had to learn to accept that there are just some things that are negative in life that if we embrace the reality that it hurts, it loses its power. And that took me a while because I was pretty determined I was going to lick the thing right mm-hmm. away. And, and um, I had to learn it was a different way through this one. What, what about demonic factors and deliverance from demons? Is, is that in the category of magic also? Where does that fit? No, I think, look, the, the demonic is real, and the demonic can be there. And certainly when the demonic was there, I had to address it. It wasn't as if, um, now I, I'm familiar with deliverance. This wasn't a matter of me needing to be delivered. This was a matter of my soul was, um, I was I was battling deep, deep anguish and and sadness and grief and anxiety. And the enemy takes advantage of that. He comes at us when we're down. And so I had to, on the one hand, um, you know, the, the deal with the spiritual warfare, which was exhausting in and of itself, because it was relentless, and at the same time, deal with the anxiety and the depression. So it was a it was a pretty intense reality. Um, so I'm I'm not denying either dimension. I'm saying. Both was a double whammy. Yep. It was intense. Yep, got it. And and many times we are way too simplistic. It's either or, and yeah. whatever helped the last. You know, if, if God uses me in a particular way, well, that's going to fix it for everybody. And yeah, and then that only drives things deeper. People may mean well, but it only drives right. the the hopelessness deeper. So uh, yeah. obviously, uh, for those that are listening, and you're saying, "Wow, th- this is relevant to me," or I've got a family member, friend that that could really use this. So, so the book will help. In other words, the book is not three and a half years, dark night of the soul, and and then the last page I came out of it. I mean, you've got the journey through the midst of it and the journey out by God's grace. So there right. there is hope right. throughout. But it, in short, now, if you were talking to someone that's that's watching or listening to the broadcast, or they're going to read your book, and they're they just don't see any way out. They they, yeah. they can't even see that they're on, on the edge of hope, and they're believers. They're children of God. What, right. what would you say to them? Number one, we are loved by God. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The triune God is a God of love, and he will always be loyal in that love. 
whether I understand the sufferings I'm going through or not, does not change who God is. God is not the author of evil. God didn't will that I go through this thing, and God didn't determine that I had to suffer these things. You know, some of the sufferings, Michael, that we go through are the genuine sufferings of Christ. Some of the sufferings we go through are the result of our brokenness and our areas where our cognitions are not as clear as they need to be. And so it's not always easy to sort all those out, but either way, it's suffering, and we have to deal with it. But we have to know we're loved. That's number one. Number two, we can't run away from negative thoughts and negative feelings. The only way out is through. And I thought if I, had, if I accepted those thoughts, I was accepting defeat. And I had to realize there's a difference between accepting those negative thoughts and feelings and resigning myself to them. And when I realized... I had to accept the pain without resigning myself to it. I got in touch with that deeper core that was in Mark Sharona from the day he was saved, that God had ordained my life for his purpose and his glory. And when I, lit, when I chose to stay in that core place, come hell or high water, I resolved I would go through for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of my wife and my kids, for the sake of the people I love at the local church, and for the sake of the body of Christ. Mm. And, and Mark, a lot of the gospel that's preached in America is very superficial because often we don't have suffering attached to it. We don't really have a theology of suffering. There's not often a cost to pay for following Jesus, as is common in other countries where persecution is very real. Do you think with that that we have presented a false picture of what it means to be born again, walk with the Lord, a false picture of the gospel, and that contributes to our problems because we're not expecting difficulty? Oh, gosh, Michael, you know, you and I could talk about this for hours. As a matter of fact, we, you and I need to do a podcast where, where, where I interview you on this because I think this is such an important topic. I mean, when Paul, when Paul speaks of the sufferings of Christ and he talks about the spirit of glory and the spirit of suffering go together. I somehow, where we lost our way, I think, was we got so embroiled in... I want to be very careful how I say this, because, look, we both are involved in media. We both love the fact that God has graced us with the ability to touch a lot of people. I'm grateful to God for every opportunity. I'm grateful for all the men and women of God that have poured into my life. The challenge, I think, in the American culture is that we've become a celebrity culture, and there's this drivenness to 15 minutes of fame, which is very short-lived. And with that, there's this syndrome that comes that you think you're impervious to the human condition and to suffering when God never promises us that we're not going to suffer. He's, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. And I do think right now, Michael, uh, and I, I trust you agree with me, that if revival is going to come, it's not when the roof is going to blow up, it's going to when the bottom falls out. Woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of... I know that's not popular to confess that, but Isaiah confessed that. Peter falls down in, in the boat at the, at the feet of Jesus and says, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, don't worry, we're going to start catching people. But there's something about yep. a broken and a contrite spirit that I think is essential to the move of the Spirit. And that brokenness is that place where we're willing to allow the pains of the human condition to touch us at our core. And I don't, I don't think there's any other way around that. Yeah, I was just uh, looking at a quote from Samuel Chadwick, who was the teacher of Leonard Ravenhill, in one of my books that I was quoting in another book. And he said, the church always fails at the point of self-confidence. And, yeah. and there is that aspect, like you quoted from 2 Corinthians 1, Paul saying, we felt the sentence of death, why? So we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but in God who raises us from the dead. And, and so out of this hellish season that you went through, good has come out of it, right? And, and it has yeah. brought you more into the character of Jesus, which is the ultimate goal that God has for our lives. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, there would have been a day when if people came up to me and said they were battling anxiety, I would have quoted a few Bible verses and prayed for them. 
I can't do that anymore. I, f- I feel their pain now, and I, I have a whole different approach because I understand how anxiety works. And simply quoting Paul or Jesus on anxiety without going into the depth of what Paul is saying about the nature of anxiety and the nature of what supplication is, which requires bringing those deep pains to speech and owning what's behind them prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, which is not always easy when you're going Mm -hmm. through that hellish place, saying thank you to God in the midst of that, in spite of that. That's that's tough stuff. So, yeah, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but I wouldn't trade where I am now for the world because I'm so in love with Jesus. I, I love Jesus more today than I've ever loved him before. Yeah, and that's the reality of God's redemption. You hope to never go through something like that, but you realize... You wouldn't be who you were without it. Friends, yeah. the new book just out today, On the Edge of Hope, No Matter How Dark the Night, The Redeemed Soul Still Sings, a book that very few people could write because the depth of the story is something that some never come out of. So thank God we're in the midst of hope. We're in the midst of the reality of God's redemption. This book will minister to you. And Mark, you tell me when, and we'll do that podcast. God bless. I'm going to have, I'll have Misty call you. Love you much, Mike. Love you too. God bless.